from Krypton Radio and the creators of the Hanging With Web Show, it's the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Look inside and behind the scenes at some of the most enduring and beloved science fiction world. Step inside the doors to a world that is bigger, brighter, and beyond imagination. And now, join your host, Christian Basil, as you become a part of the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Hello again, fellow Whovians, and welcome back to another episode of the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS radio show. I'm your host, Christian Basil, and we're going to be reviewing, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, the Serenga Conundrum. The con- 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 did, con- did I say that right? Con- 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 conundrum. 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 I, I, okay, there you go. What, what she said. There you go. That <laughs> conundrum. 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 Incredibly <laughs> ironic. Yeah. Kettle drum, whatever. I'm mean, one. <clears throat> well, the fifth episode in the eleventh series and thirteenth Doctor episode of Doctor Who. So, if you haven't seen it yet, you may want to put this on pause and then watch the episode. But first, as always, we start off with the Who New News. Humbug. Oh, <laughs> kettle drums. Okay. Um, well, the ratings dropped. To 6.1 million viewers for our latest episode, so that's a conundrum in and of itself. Um, viewers say uh, a couple of different things. One, that it's too PC for them to continue watching, and the other one is a complaint with Chibnall's writing. Which oh, is their, yeah, I'm sure we'll be going into those dropping. things mm-hmm. <laughs> when we pick apart this episode. Yes. well, and, From Chibnall's writing. And in other Who New News, um, the Christmas special which has yes. happened for the last 13 years, has actually been canceled for 2018. That's why I'm saying humbug. Yes, um, but they are going to have a New Year's Day special. They said that the team has run out of festive storylines. It's and a then, brand new team. It's a brand new team. They yes. do what they want to do. But uh, I, I don't know. Kevin, did you see my posting earlier? I didn't. And I posted this. I said, I had an idea for a Christmas episode, and they kind of dropped it. Um, I wrote a fanfic in my head. That said that it was an episode idea is the doctor tries to take his or her companions to see Christmas and turns out that every 25th of December has disappeared completely. The 25th of December does not exist in all of the universe. And Hmm. the doctor has to figure out how this happened, why it happened and what she can do and her companions to fix it and put everything back. And I posted this last year, and I said, this would be a cool episode, and I called it The Doctor Who Saved Christmas. Huh, I like running, that. It was a, it was a, and I thought, and I, I said, I even said that, you know what, Peter Capaldi at the time, in a Santa outfit, that would be the intro, that would be the whole thing about this, that Peter would be walking around with a Santa outfit trying to save Christmas, and uh, said so we can do it today, so I, I, I... You need to send that to somebody. I did. I put it on Facebook. <laughs> and I tagged the BBC in. Well, since we're already starting off here and talking about it, let me go ahead and introduce the team. Uh, we have Jessica. Hello. Hello there. Jessica with Song Swan. Yep. Jessica, <laughs> Jessica Walmack. And we have Mr. Kevin J. Kessler, who's got his own show now. If you want to talk about it a little bit here for our fans who may be interested in the in the DC universe on CW. Sure, yeah. We have a, a new show called The Just Us Watchtower. It is a look at the CW DC shows, The Flash, Arrow, uh, Legends of Tomorrow. Um, we are, uh, and, you know, Black Lightning and Supergirl. We, we are going in-depth on all of them every single week. We, have a, we just had our first episode last week. It was really awesome and wonderful. Uh, we have a, uh, another episode coming at you this week featuring a special panel of Jessica and Sage. So it's going to be like a little reunion of uh, tonight. Cool. Sweet. And you already you already recorded last week. You had your premiere last week. How yeah, we, we had a premiere. It went very, very well. But the one thing I do really want to mention this week is my uh, I'm also a fantasy author, and my first book, Ross and Auntie, is currently free on Kindle. Sweet. Ooh. So go, guys, all check that out out there. I've got, now I've got a question, and, and what do you guys think about this? Jessica, starting off with you, no Christmas special, possibly a New Year's. What was it, a New Year's Day special? Yep, New Year's Day. New Year's Day special. So we're getting rid of the Christmas special, or maybe this is a trend. What do you think about having a Christmas special this year? I'm sad. 
Um, Because we're trying to get into the feel of, you know, I know we've got new writers and everything, but, you know, the whole thing is like we're trying to get it to make it feel like Doctor Who since we have kind of uprooted everything. And I feel like by not giving us that glorious Christmas special, we're kind of like, even when we didn't have a season, we had a Christmas special. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm really sad because I'm like, guys, this is the thing. This could have been your thing that made it feel like Doctor Who again. Like Mm -hmm. nothing has to make sense. Nothing has to have a continuation of a storyline for Christmas, at least. So I'm... Part of me is holding on to hope that they'll, like, surprise us and be like, surprise, we did one anyway, and it's premiering tomorrow, you know, and tells us like, <laughs> Christmas Eve. Um, but, yeah, I'm really sad. <laughs> Kevin, you know? is Chibnall a humbug? I gotta say, I don't really buy the whole, like, oh, well, the team has run out of festive ideas. It's a brand new team. If they don't have any festive ideas, it means they never had them to begin with. Exactly. It's not like they've written the last 10 years of Christmas specials. It's a brand new writing team. So that's a load of hooey. But yeah, I agree with Jessica. It, 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 this series having a hard time feeling like Doctor Who. Um, I don't buy the it's too PC because if your biggest problem with a show is it's, it, it says racism is bad, that says more about you than it says about the show. But not giving us the Daleks, not giving us Cybermen, not giving us a Christmas episode. It feels like it's different to get di- to be different at this point. I think he should have at least done a little like pull in a little bit. He didn't have to go completely. I, I mean, he went completely 180 and like, I'm not going to have plastic monsters. We're going to have a female doctor. We're going to totally do this, have a new composer. I mean, like just kind of trend it out. He almost did a, a JJ Abrams to the classic series. Like don't, nobody who was in the classic series is going to be in this one. And I think it should have integrated before he went into maybe wait until the second or third series of his and Jody's to go, okay, you know, we're going to go completely AWOL. And instead of having the Christmas episode, maybe we can have the Halloween episode or something like that. But it's not an easy, an, an easy thing for Dr. Who when you're kind of just Okay, everything we're going to do is changing. It's not even like... I, I feel like he should at least condition people into what he was doing. Or, like, well, skip next Christmas or something. I yeah. don't know. Mm-hmm. But, you know it, reminds, just, it, it feels like Disney with, with Star Wars. They're like, oh, we're, we're giving you three new films, and everyone's so excited. And we're like, yeah, we're going to kill off all the people you love <laughs> just to make it our own. And I'm like... Yeah. That's, not how, you, yet, that's so. not how you do that. And so it was... You know, I got. The, I'm getting that same feel of like, let's get rid of anything and everything that ha- that actually defines it as Doctor Who, except for the Doctor. And I was like, what? That doesn't make sense. They are not done shaking things up either. Um, starting, no. yeah, starting uh, November 18th, that Sunday, um, they are making room for David Attenborough's nature documentary series, which runs for five weeks. So they're going to change the time, and it's going to be even earlier. It starts at 6:30. Hmm. Think you guys can swing it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Do you, does that mean BBC America is going to change it? Or does that mean j- the BBC? Oh, well, my article was unclear. It's just that they're changing. Oh, okay. They're just that they're changing the time to make room for that five week documentary run. Interesting. Huh. Uh-huh. Make way, make way, make way. Yes. Okay. What else have we got in the news stage? Oh, we do have some other interesting news. Um, the older, some of the older episodes of Doctor Who, you know, have been disappearing because they haven't managed to change them over into other formats, and they've been trying to digitize the older episodes as fast as they can before they just turn uh-huh. into dust. But um, the Wheel in Space is actually yeah. going to be released in a six-episode animated series, so everybody will get to see that. They're going to do a ten-minute, like first look premiere at the British Film Institute next month. Hmm. So I thought that was kind of interesting. If you like some of that's exciting. Yeah. For those who want the older episodes. I still believe, and I still believe to this conspiracy that I've created this day, that Moffat has every episode of Doctor Who sitting in his bedroom somewhere. And then every once in a while, just so you know, he said, well, I need a new swimming pool. He'll release one of them that we've never seen before. And then (laughs) just comes out of somewhere there. But, um, I, what do you guys think? Because like, um, the first, Troughton episode. They premiered at the theaters over here, over at uh, the AMC theaters and over by uh, Cinemark. What do you guys think of watching Doctor Who in the movie theaters? 
I like that. Um, the um, Fathom Events does some of the bigger episodes. Like they did Day of the Doctor. They actually did. Um, uh, they do all the Christmas specials, and they do. Uh, they did Jody's first episode, all in movie theaters. I think it's great. But do you think it's just overkill, Jessica? Do you think because they first of all they'll have them in the movie theaters, uh, they'll or they'll have them on TV, and then five, three or five days later they'll put them on in the theater. Do you think that might be overkill, or do you think I I, I, I kind of like it? I like it. I mean, people are still buying tickets and still going. Yeah. So you know, it's kind of like a mini con. But it's only Doctor Who. Um, but yeah, no, I think it gives a, an opportunity to be able to watch it because sometimes the reactions of people around you make it better and enhance it. Yes. And I think that's what a cinema situation gives you because sometimes that makes it, you know, you'll like an episode that you never would have even been like, oh, it's a good, you know, not my favorite. But you see it in cinema and you're like, oh. Everyone was cheering. It was so wonderful, you know, and it just kind of enhances that uh, environment of seeing it. So I'm totally for watching uh, Doctor Who in the cinema. Well, I've told friends before, if you want to see a Disney film, you see it with cast members out in the audience because they will enhance the experience because they'll laugh at every joke. They'll cry at every uh, the, every sad scene. And I think it's the same thing with Whovians because I love to see the Whovians, especially when you go out to people you've never even met who have the same love and passion for the show and you get to see them cosplaying actually walking into the theater and stuff. So I, I really, really, yeah, it, it is a small convention. I love going out and seeing everybody dress up and, and, you know, telling them about and, and geeking out which, who's your favorite doctor and stuff like that. How do you think the show is going there? Well, any uh, some more news there, Sage? I do have one other piece of news. Sure. Which entertains me. Um, Alan Cumming, okay. who, who we all know as Nightcrawler from X-Man 2, or at least yes. that's what I loved him in. Um, he just recently um, won a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Scottish uh, BAFTAs, and he is talking about starring in an upcoming episode on The Doctor, and he is going to play who in Scotland they call King James the Sixth, but we know him as King James the First of England. And in that episode, they are going to travel back into the 17th century and become embroiled in a witch trial. How cool is that? Ooh. Yeah. I was hoping that's what something that the uh, the 13th Doctor would run into is the, the, the witch trials. <laughs> And how she, that, I think that was the first thing I said, and especially if you've seen our friends on uh, Doctor Who Velocity with uh, Crystal Crystal Moore, she actually actually answered that question in the first episode that she did, because her first premiere was the Doctor going to well, the Salem Witch Trial, and how she reacted to that. So I would love to see how, uh, I would love to see uh, 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 Jody's Doctor involved in the Salem Witch Trials. What do you think of an episode like that, guys? Oh, I... I think it would be great. That's exciting. Yeah, I think I think it could be cool. I think it definitely uh, could have a pretty cool um, uh, idea behind it. The DC Legends of Tomorrow just did it, but I think it could still be cool. Sweet, sweet, sweet. And I, I, do, I would love to see – if you guys haven't seen Doctor Who Velocity, please check it out. You can go on Facebook. The episodes are out there. I believe they're on their third episode, and they premiered the last episode this Halloween. So check it out. Give Crystal and the team our love. And when we come back, we're going to be jumping in and talking and reviewing about the Serang. Go ahead. Do it. You can do it. No. The Seranga, but I need I need Jessica to close it out. <laughs> Conundrum. Conundrum. Yes. The the. Conundrum. Jump. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. <laughs> we got more of the legend coming up. It's Germany, 1938. Charlotte is a 15-year-old girl living in the Jewish quarter. George lives in the city proper and enamored by Charlotte's charm and grace when she wanders into his cobbler shop. George decides right then and there that he is going to marry her. Follow along as this unlikely couple struggles to stay one step ahead of the Gestapo and their dramatic escape from Nazi Germany. Good Things Always Happen in Springtime, from author Joanne Fisher, on Amazon.com today. Grab some altitude and adventure together at Pound the Grape. It's all about an adventure above the crowd. There's always something different happening there, from painting to food pairings to dancing. But one thing's rock solid, people sharing incredible wines from around the world. And if that's not what puts lift under your wing, try their craft beer. Grab some altitude and adventure at Pound the Grape. Find more at poundthegrape.com. Poundthegrape.com. Pour a glass of adventure. Now back to your host, Christian Hazel. Wow, who is that? 
That was kind of weird. Hey, hi, folks. Welcome back to the Legend of the Traveling TARDIS radio show. I'm here with a Jessica Womack and the lovely Kevin J. Kessler with his show. Give it, a, give, give it that title again. The just I can us. never say right. Just like the Condemned the, Gym. <laughs> the, ju- the Just Us Watchtower. The Just Us Watchtower. Please check it out if you haven't. It's a very, very cool show there. If you're into the DC CW universe, you definitely want to check it out. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the rating scale that we have, we do it between 1 and 10 TARDISes, 1 being bad, 10 being good. And the lowest score is going to get to go first. So, Kevin, I'm going to hit you first. What would you rate the... Serenga conundrum. I honestly, I give it a five. Okay, Jessica, what would you hit the conundrum with? Um, I would actually give it a seven. Guess what, Kevin? I'm on your ship too. I'm giving it a five. So mm. both of us had the lower score. So I guess, um, Kevin, you're my guest. You started off. Why did you rank it a five? What were the good and bad points about the conundrum? Here's the thing. Chibnall, I feel like, is starting to get a little... um, He's getting a little grabby with characters that feel a lot like other things. Uh, Last week we had, you know, Aragon from Harry Potter. Yeah, like he's grabbing other intellectual properties and kind of repackaging them. Um, So last week he grabbed Aragog from Harry Potter. This year, I mean, this just could have been called (laughs) Daco and Stick. (laughs) That thing... Yeah, that it, it was Stitch. Like, it, even well, when they're just like, "Oh, he could survive." Rama character too. So you know, I'm just like, they're like, "Oh, he could survive in the vacuum. He's you know, he's bulletproof. He can't be destroyed." And it's Experiment Six Two Six. I'm, you know, my other podcast is a Walt Disney World. There's an information podcast. I know Stitch when I see him. He even looked like Stitch. Um, I do love whenever we join a journey midway, like we did in the beginning, when they're on that junk planet. Um, the, um, you know, taking the Sonic out of commission early on definitely helped the, uh, the episode build some suspense, uh, mm-hmm. because we didn't, we didn't have the, sometimes the, I feel like the Sonic is a two sex machina. Like it's, it's used as a get out of jail free card a lot of times. And I'm glad that they didn't, they didn't have it to go back to here over and over. The one thing that really shines through this episode for me more is just Jody's compassion as the doctor. If, uh-huh. if there's one thing to, that I could call this doctor, it is compassionate. Uh, compassionate in a way that we haven't seen probably since David Tennant with his I'm sorry's. Um, the, um, the Pating, um, I, listen, it's a decent, cool villain. It, I wrote that it sounds like the sound when you spit in a bucket. Like like in the old like <laughs> shows, like when they're spitting tobacco, ding. Um, <laughs> That's where they get their sound from. <laughs> the side plot of, of about fathers and sons with Ryan and the pregnant dude, I thought was actually really well done. It gave us an gave us some nice background information on Ryan. We finally got to hear what happened to his mother. We understand now why him and his father are estranged the way they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that I liked in this episode was the theme of hope. Uh, I loved that little speech the doctor gives about hope and how she first imagines the the outcome that she wants and then figures out how to get there. I thought that was a really interesting look into the doctor's mind and the doctor's thought process. You know, picture the solution, then find it. Find it. Um, the um, I'm trying to figure out what I wrote here. Um, the yeah, I don't know what I you wrote. You hate there, that so. too when he writes something down. <laughs> it's important, and you're like. Oh my goodness! I wrote it in hieroglyphics. I need yeah. I need a Rosetta Stone to translate what I just wrote. I just you know hope prevails in the end, and I thought that was a very very well done. Um, all in all, I just kind of felt like this episode felt like filler. Um, it, it it really didn't contribute to the overall story, but we haven't really gotten an overarching story this season yet. We don't have a big bad. We don't have anything that we're like. There, there's no overhanging mystery. Moffat always had that overhanging mystery, you know, whether it was whether it was Silence Will Fall or Bad Wolf or um, which was, you know, um, not Moffat. That was um, Davies. That was Russell. Oh, Russell T. Um, but there was always that that thread. There's no thread this time. We have no, you know, we, we're not seeing a big bad. So that is a completely different change of pace for the show and i don't know if it's going to serve the show well in the end but uh, he, and, isn't that what he mentioned earlier that the, the, the episodes were going to be individual we weren't going to have a bad wolf we weren't going to have a silence yeah we and i don't and i don't because like it just kind of i, I think, hate that i think moffat kind of took it too far well, moffat took and it when, too far because his stories were like over over the top and overdone and I, you had to be yeah i still don't understand what happened with the silence in trenzalore like i i don't get it but um 
the the last thing I'll say about this episode is that an avocado is unequivocally a fruit. <laughs> it's got a seed. That's what I'm saying. It it's it's got a seed. It's produced by the fertilized ovary of a flower and contains a seed of which it was born. It is that, a fruit. The, and that's what legitimizes the fruit is the seed, right? That, Am I wrong? Yeah. No, you're that right. and okay. having an outer layer. Um, yeah. It has to have an outer layer like a apple has that peely coat. thing. Uh, that's a technical term. Yep. But Graham was right. Coat thing. <laughs> Those things. Right. Graham was right. It was a. It is a fruit. Graham was right. It is a fruit. Okay. Um, I'm going to pose this question to you, Jessica, because I know you rated high as a seven, but this one is the one question I had to challenge. Why this episode, and why here in this spot? Are you saying like why this particular story arc this at was... this point in time in the? I'm, I'm going to, and I'm probably should have, this is the question that was ringing in my head. Why did this episode even exist? And why was it put right here behind uh, the Arachnids episode? And I, I'm hoping because you had a higher rating than I, I did, maybe you had a better answer or had an answer to it because I could not answer that question. It's like, why well, is this here? I thought it was just, it was just a good old sci-fi episode. Um, cause the, the last two that we've had, they've, they've had a very heavy hand in them. Okay. One was, you know, race issue. The next one was political issue. And this one was just like, all right, let's go Tone back to basics. This is just like a good old fashioned. We're on a starship. We run into a problem. We fix that problem and we throw in some alien aspects to it, which I've been missing. I haven't seen a good alien in a while. And we got to see a couple, we got a good Android that looks a little too Star Trekky for my opinion, but you know. Oh, there's another um, one he grabbed. He grabbed Data. Yeah. Oh gosh, that was so. I was like, okay, so we got Stitch and Star Trek all in one. But that's one of my only issues. But yeah, it was just a good old fashioned, you know, sci-fi episode. I loved the the fact that they actually had science in it with the antimatter generator mm. and i you know there was just and the way the pilot and the science behind like a pilot heart and how you would have that adrenaline that's just right around your heart and like there was just a lot of good science actual science fiction in this episode which is why i gave it a bit of a higher rating okay. um because i just i enjoyed <laughs> that aspect of it because everything's been about humans which is great. You know, I am one. I have to, you know, be a little biased towards them. But it's been a little too human-y for me. Mm-hmm. So, and I mm-hmm. loved, dude, loved, loved, loved the, the one paramedic guy that died. Spoilers. <laughs> but he was wonderful because the doctor doesn't run into a lot of people who can say, no, I know what I'm doing. I'm taking command of this. And the doctor was like, all right, I don't always... You know, sometimes I can be on even ground with someone on certain things, and I just, it was a, it, it felt good. Now, the Stitch design, eh, if it had looked different, though, wouldn't the ratings be a little bit higher, maybe, on your part, Kevin? I don't know. But it did look like Stitch, and it did look like Star Trek with the others. <laughs> yeah. And, but but uh, my, my... my thing with the Patang though, is that I would... I, I feel like this might have been, like, a setup for in a future episode, we get, like, many Patang. Oh, gosh. If well, one of... I, I, uh, uh, what is it? Complaint. I couldn't think of the word complaint. A complaint I heard about it was that uh, the Patang was a little too OP. <coughs> um, which, in layman's terms, is overpowering. Like, because it was almost impossible to take it down you can't touch it you can't you know trap it you can't contain it it can survive in vacuum yeah and i heard that as a complaint but i enjoyed that because i don't know i i like a challenge and i really enjoyed the fact that because it almost reminded me of the the planet uh akatan where it just eats and eats and eats Mm -hmm. and it just needs all that energy but it was in such a small form so it you know for me it kind of threw back to a little bit of that planet on Akatan and I don't know I I enjoyed it because it was just it had a bow at the end people died I shouldn't say that I love that but I do <laughs> not in real Sadist. life I need to yeah I need to clarify not in real life uh-huh. I, I like a little bit of darkness to it because 
the past few episodes have been a little bit more. Yeah, yeah there we go. Makes me not sound as psychotic. <laughs> yeah, I like stakes. higher stakes. There okay. We go. Well, <laughs> no, that's fine. I don't. I don't know if I'm gonna stand next to you at conventions anymore. But anyway, I this know, goes. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's Jessica. Just make sure you know no sudden movements when she's around. <laughs> There's a reason I cosplay River Song. Like. <laughs> oh yeah. That's right. And on that note, anyway, um, yeah, no. Okay, so the reason why I gave it a five is from the, from the get go. Uh, what was the first episode about? The Doctor loses the TARDIS, gets rescued on a ship when she's in trouble in mid space. So how did this start out? Doctor loses the TARDIS, she gets in trouble in mid space, and is rescued by another ship. So I'm like, okay, didn't we have this in the in the first episode? So that that's what kind of threw me off. I was like, you you just repeating that and. I'm like, who put? And I was thinking the same thing. It's kind of weird. It was like, who puts a who puts a mine in a, in the middle of a a junk a junk planet? And I I think of my transformer days. I'm sorry, but I called it junkie on every now and then because that that was the only name I could give to the planet. So uh, I mean, I just there were just some things that it was kind of almost moffish that you have to accept it. It's there. Take it. Suspension and, of disbelief. They definitely were relying on a little bit of suspension it, of disbelief with this it was, one. It was not. The, it was not only that, but okay. Evil Stitch, or what I've seen on the internet a couple times, evil adipose gone wrong with Stitch's face. I mean, uh, there were some weird analogies too, but but yeah, I'm going to call it Evil Stitch. It's the Patang, and I just the first thing I, that was really weird about it was that the Doctor knows that this creature eats or at least uh, is under the presumption that it eats metal and stuff. And the first thing she does is she takes her Sonic and sticks it practically right in his face. And she's surprised when it gets eaten by the the creature. I'm like, you just, I've seen the doctor like stand like yards away holding the Sonic and go, okay, and get a reading off of it. She walked up and said, here you go. And was surprised that the Sonic was going to get eaten. So I was, that was just one of the weird parts. And I just like, I like the episode because if 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 we're going by what you're saying, Jessica, that we had this roller coaster ride, and if the last two episodes were like the roller coaster coming down, now we have the roller coaster kind of going around, you know, the turn. So this might be something a little bit less, something a little bit. Um, I think one of the things that I would also mention, and, and Kevin, you said that you thought Doctor Who would. You, people are complaining that it was too PC. Mm-hmm. And I don't have it on the complaint that it's too PC. I just think that Whovians don't need the PC lecture. We know racism is bad. We know that misogyny is bad. We know all these are bad. And why are we getting pounded and pounded again on why these things are bad? Well, you are dealing with historical moments and right. that's part of history it's it just happens to be that history is repeating itself so we can draw a parallel for modern viewers i i don't think that's a terrible thing so you think it's maybe mostly for viewers who are coming into the episode that you know who've never seen doctor who before they're trying to appease them and saying hey you know what i think it makes it re- it makes the episodes relatable okay you know okay. you can't you can't always count on lore that's 50 some odd years old Got it there. Okay, folks, uh, hang tight. Uh, I've got a question for you, Jessica, but we're going to hang on to that question when I come back after commercial. Please continue to stay logged on, stay tuned in, and become part of the legend. We'll be right back. Hang tight. From author Sherry Ressler comes the Evening Bower series, a prophecy from the lost city of Atlantis, a pairing whose union will change the future. Magical creatures, prophecy, destiny, and love collide in a new kind of romance. It's Sherry Ressler's Evening Bower series, a haunting and compelling tale pulled from humanity's lost histories. Begin the adventure with time and blood on Amazon.com today. Forever is only the beginning. In the summer of 1953, private investigator Will Lucky Marks was working as the in-house private eye for Arcane Pacific Pictures. Trapped inside the studio with the killer, Lucky must find the killer before time runs out. Lot 28. Own it today. Available iTunes and Amazon.com. All right, we're back, and thank you for staying with us with The Legend of the Traveling Tardis as my friends and I 
we continue to review the Seranga Conundrum. Did I get that right? Yeah. Anybody want to complain? Close. It was close. It was close. <laughs> it was it was close. close enough. What do you mean it's close? That was the best I could do. Right <laughs> no, no. It was Shush. good. <laughs> Shush. Well, Jessica, I do have a question for you. And this is kind of what I was relating to this story because I went back and kind of been researching Chibnall and the four, ep- I think he wrote four episodes. And to me, one of them was like 40, this was kind of in the way of 42. Whereas Chibnall just kind of throw something in there and you, and again, like a Moffat story, you just kind of have to accept what's being in there. One of which was that, uh, like in the spaceship in 42, they had to solve all these clues to get to the other side of the ship. And the first thing I'm thinking about is, who the hell puts in an alarm system like that? Why would you put in an alarm <laughs> system like that? So I'm thinking about what they gave the schematics of the creature, the Pating, was that, yeah, it had a, you couldn't touch it. <laughs> um, it you know, it was very dangerous. It was very, and I, w- I was thinking to myself also, the Doctor has been on enough junk planets and he or she would never have caught him across this creature at one point or another. But I, I guess there's, you know, there's so many things out there. Maybe the doctor has not seen it as of yet. So I don't know. What, what, what do you guys think as the Pating as a device for moving the story along? Well, the Pating came from space, not the junk planet. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they were, they were, they were four days out from the the junk planets that they were coming from. So I don't know how it catapulted itself, which is kind of cool, but I guess object in motion station in motion. So who knows how long the Pating had been in space and from where it even came from. Right. But I think it's, it makes sense because even things on earth sometimes surprise the doctor of like, even after 2000 years traveling all of time and space, there was just like a, you know, there's definitely things that pop up and it's like, what? That's new, you know? And Okay. And I apologize. Make... I shouldn't have said the junk plan. I mean, just traveling in space and oh, yeah. something like. So I think it's, of... especially because we're, we're in a year that I don't think the doctor's really been much in this century. Um, the one thing that I have to question though, is why is someone in, what was it? 76, no, 67th century. 67th, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. How do they not know about time travel? Because it was all over the 51st century. Very true. <laughs> like, all over the 51st century. That was, that was one of the things that bothered me. That's a like, pothole. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, excuse me? Just not on but this maybe... side of the galaxy. They figured it out. Yeah. yeah. I was this like, well, we don't know where this out. is. I guess that's true. But that, it... that bothered me. I was just like, um, I'm pretty sure there was a bunch of time agents with a bunch of time vortex manipulators mm-hmm. in the 51st century, and they never made their way to the 67th century. Maybe it's a boring century. I don't know. Right. Well, it's probably kind of like you know, uh, uh, you know, in our classic his- in our history, um, you know, being on the planet when, you know, when people have come and had higher technology than the people who were he- you know here before. How did they have to translate and how they had to relate to things? And especially like uh, now that you mentioned with the Pating, maybe that she she didn't see this or she's never come across this. The doctor has never seen something in the past because I mean, we're constantly going through the earth and every day we're finding a new species. In some cases, some of the species that we think were extinct are coming back and making a comeback from somewhere there. Um, Kevin. Yes. The line that I thought, and I, I wish I had done this in the previous episodes, but normally I, I get a catchphrase or a line from an episode and that becomes the line of the, that, that particular episode. And the one thing that stuck out in my mind is there's, there aren't enough kind people. Yes. What do you say about that and how that relates to the story that's going on there? I think it's 10,000% true. I think that's constantly a thing that the doctor is dealing with throughout the, it's, it's like a common theme within the galaxy, you know, or throughout the universe, the doctor encounters is, are, are there kind people out there and why don't we have more? Um, I 100% resonate with that because that's a question that I ask myself all the time uh, be- because sometimes it just seems like I had an interesting conversation with a friend where we were talking about like dolphins and like other animals that have like like good levels of intelligence and how they do things that are cruel for the sake of cruelty and mm-hmm. you know with intelligence does that does that bring with it cruelty like is that our natural state as creatures and I think that that's a question that the doctor has to struggle with and answer on a consistent basis. So Jessica, do you think it's cruel to be kind? Um, 
that, huh? Well, I I just thought that kindness was kind of just a, a little bit of a throwback to Capaldi because that was one yes. of his main through lines was was be kind. Mm. If anything, be kind. Run, uh, run, run fast, laugh hard, be kind. Yes. And so you think so she's learning? She she actually was listening the whole time he was talking, yeah, even though he was the and, same person. Yeah. But the other thing of that is, it is our you know natural state to do bad things. Like if you you don't have to learn to lie. Lying just usually comes naturally, or you observe it. Same things with being cruel. A lot of that is either learned or as a retaliation to someone else's cruelness. Kindness is work because we live in a society, well, we do, and so is the universe, in in an area where people are not kind. And so to retaliate cruelty with kindness, it's... It is a work and it's a job and it's easier to take the steps to to be cruel back because retaliation and revenge and all this other stuff. But really, I think that's really what it is. It's it's you have to consciously be kind. No one is inherently kind automatically. It is it is a decision that you make. Okay, well, then I'll pose this question to you both. In the world of Chimel, from the episodes that you see, is the human race cruel or is the human race kind? It's both. Mm. It's, it's both. the yin and yang. Yeah, and I think that the point uh, that he's trying to make and that I think is being made is that there is darkness in every light and there is light in every darkness. Like Jess just said, though, the yin and the yang. So, the, so like classic who of the fifth, fourth and fifth doctor, you can't have the white guardian without the black guardian. Yes. Yes. In that in that retrospect, and you guys, I hope you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I, no. I just remember the end of uh, what was it of Enlightenment, and uh, and the 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 White Guardian says, uh, you know, I can't exist without him. He exists with me, mm-hmm. even though they're and both trying to take each other on. Yeah. And I'm sorry to make another Star Wars reference in this one, but it it takes you back to literally if you've seen The Last Jedi. Spoilers for The Last Jedi. But one of the things that Luke was trying to do is get rid of the Sith. And he was like, well, if I get rid of the Jedi, then the Sith will disappear. That's Mm -hmm. not true. They both exist and they both have to exist to balance each other out. And that's the same with kindness and cruelty. If you stop being kind, that doesn't mean cruelty goes away. And if you stop being cruel, that doesn't mean kindness goes away. They both have to coexist. One of my favorite lines from the original Kingdom Hearts is, the closer you get to the light, the larger your shadow becomes. Yes. That's beautiful. Oh, that's a good one there. One of the interesting things that I liked about this, here, this particular episode is Jody had this weird fascination with the antimatter chamber. And I mean, her eyes completely lit up. And I love the explanation because it takes on two both things. Um, actually, one, but uh, there, there's another doctor that she's actually pulling out of. But I just, I'm taken back, Kevin, to the time where the fourth doctor is explaining to Leela how, the, how it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Mm-hmm. And. Even Leela's going, oh, that's that's stupid. <laughs> but I just, I, I love it when the Doctor has those moments when he or she is looking at something and almost like a David Tennant moment, oh, you're beautiful! Mm-hmm. Even in an antimatter chamber, she's looking basically in the hood of an engine while it's running and going, look at what's going on over there. What, what would you think of that moment it's and pro- how it relates to her? It's progress. Mm-hmm. And I think I think she actually uses the word progress. It is yeah. it's that it's that Walt Disney obsession with make things better. You know, one little spark of inspiration is a great, <laughs> big, beautiful tomorrow. Like it's it is the carousel of progress, and and that I think is what she was pointing out. That like this is where the technology of CERN, the super collider, eventually gets to because mm-hmm. it's all progress. Everything becomes smaller and cheaper. Uh, and more commonplace as time goes on. And, you know, you look at the first computer, it was the size of a house, and now we carry them around in our pockets. Mm-hmm. So, What did you think of that moment, Jessica? I took it as a take some time to smell the flowers moment mm. of, of just the doctor just being caught off guard in the 67th century and just like, oh, this is just 
this is good. There's not, you know, there's good and bad. I think it goes back to the kindness thing. There's good and bad that come out of species and humans and everything. But like, this is just amazing. And it's, it's the show of hard work and intelligence being brought into one and just having the technology being put forward based off of intellect. And it's just for it to all come together. It's almost like when you understand the workings of a human body for the first time and you, and you realize that if our cells were a minuscule larger than they are, how much of an issue that would be. And so this is completely man-made, or well, man species, whatever galaxy mortal. they made. made, made mortal, by, mortal made, humans. there we go. Gosh, my words aren't working today. But yeah, I think it was literally a, look how beautiful this is, and I don't take enough time to really appreciate. And I think she even says something along those lines of like, sometimes you just have to step back and appreciate what's in front of you, and it's beautiful. And so, and 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 some things that are, can be devastating can be can be both devastating and beautiful at the same time. Like looking at a supernova when that explodes, how much damage and devastation is taking place across inside a galaxy. But yet, look how beautiful and encompassing and the new life and the new formations and the new things that are coming about. It's like lightning when it strikes. You know how devastating it could start a fire. It can destroy things in its path. Or volcanoes. Or volcanoes. But there's something beautiful about them, which is you know kind of the like the yin and the yang, one can't exist without the other. You can't have the devastation without the beauty in there. But if you, you know, if you look at one perspective from one thing, there's always going to be another perspective that it could be something completely different. What we see as devastation could be something like an antimatter chamber that just looks beautiful, how it runs, how much cheaper it is, how much convenient it is. And she's watching as all the, all I was waiting for was something about reversing the polarity to the neutron flow. And I would have been ecstatic for the rest of the episode. (laughs) That's all I was waiting for there. What do you guys think about the characters inside there? Astos and all the other uh, and all the other characters that were in there. Babel. Durkos. Did you guys have any challenges or anything of that nature? No, I mean they, they kind of felt just middle of the road. I know I know Jessica had mentioned the one that, that dies in the escape pod. Um, and I'm with her on that. I liked that dude. Um, but other than that, I mean, it all, it just kind of felt like a typical Doctor Who, um, story to me. Gotcha. Jessica, what do you think about the characterizations? Because you and I liked Astos, but I think that he, w- he was given the benefit of that he had some development at the beginning and we got to see it and then we got to lose him so early. And I was just like, wow, he was just a throwaway character in that respect. But we, we had some compassion for him. And I think that's what they wanted us to be- lead in. What do you think about him? Oh, yeah. Like, I absolutely adored him, but I don't think it was a throwaway. I think, you know, because sometimes you do have characters that are that are throwaways, but I think almost like, um, I, I'm going to go, uh, just like the Titanic episode, you lose so many people in that, and they're all extremely different characters, but each person that you lose, like, there was purpose behind it. They, no one died for nothing. And mm. I think his purpose was to match the doctor on intellect and everything. But he also, his last thing was admitting his faults of like, I did something stupid. This is what gets me. But like his last breath was encouraging the person that he was leaving behind that, you know, and you find out later, no one else believed in her. And he was the only one that saw that potential. And, you know, I, I think that speaks volumes. I think that goes back once again to the kindness theme that we're on of with your dying breath, instead of saying like, you know, I wish I'd done this better. It was make sure you know that you are good, that you can do this. And it, and it really wrong, you know, it reminds me of the doctor in that. I think, you know, it's, it's giving that reassurance. And I, I loved, I loved that character, but with all the other characters as well, I thought they were great. I thought it was a good mix. Um, I do not remember the pregnant guy's name. What was <laughs> I, like, I liked him. I liked him. I liked him. But he was yeah. he was good. He was just an everyday Joe type person, you know, of like I made a mis- you know, I I think a lot of the theme with this one was mistakes because you had the sister lying to the brother and you know, a, a lot of it was mistakes and and finding out how to live with those 
mistakes Jessica, in that, that. But hold that thought oh, for yeah. this moment because we're going to be coming back. We just need to pay some bills and we're going to take an additional break, our final break. We're going to be actually talking more about the ratings and the progression of the shows going on here when we get back. Stay tuned for more of the legend of the Traveling Tardis radio show. This is Cosplay Michael with the Hanging Earth Love Show. I want to tell you about my friends at Embellus Effects in Orlando, Florida. They've got makeup, costumes, and props for all of your costume needs. And the team at Embellus Effects is helpful and friendly. Embellus Effects is one of my favorite places, and I know it will be yours too. I'll see you there. Or go to EmbellusEffects.com and remember, cosplay is for everyone. Hello, sweeties. I'm Crystal Moore. I play the Doctor in fan series Doctor Who Velocity. You're listening to The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS Radio Show. Hey, folks, we're back. Thank you for staying with us with The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS Radio Show. I've got Jessica. I've got Kevin. We are wrapping up a review of the Saranga Conundrum. I got it right. Yeah, you Shut got up. it. Shut up. I got it right. This no, you got time. it. Well it done. was good. It was my conundrum. It conundrum. Never mind. For, we're going to wrap up this episode. But, Jessica, you were, you had some wonderful things to say, and I'm sorry to interrupt. But go ahead. Please oh, no. wrap up. I mean, you know, got to pay bills somehow. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> no, but it was just, you know, I, I loved the, the dynamic with all the different people. But really... It feels like a, a motif of this particular episode was noting that admitting that you made mistakes and coming clean with them. And and that's what you kind of noticed with the sister, with the brother even. Um, still don't remember their names. The pilot. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And then the pregnant guy, he was like, yeah, I made mistakes. Now I have to, you know, live with the consequences. And mm. same with the, the guy who was on the escape pod, the paramedic. You know, he his last things was, I made a mistake and, you know learn better from me, you know? So it was just, I enjoyed the dynamic of all of them. None of them fell short. None of them were, um, poorly written, all of them well acted, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was just great. Some of them added comedy, the pregnant dude, he was like a perfect comedic relief, but there was also a serious tone. So I just enjoyed it. I liked all of them. Kevin, I was waiting for the fist bump. I really, really just want to slap Ryan and go, would you just fist bump Graham? Oh, you? that's good. what the moment. heck was up yeah, with that? that. Yeah, that's... I was like, dude, you have just went into my toilet hard yeah. because that's going to be a moment when it finally happens. Yeah, like, I'm that sure is, they're, 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 they're probably it's a slow build, but it's kind of like it's not a very well done slow build because now it's just kind of like, oh, my gosh, really? Like you've been through this much together and you still won't like. You know, and they're probably going to draw that out until the last episode when he finally calls him granddad and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm sure. But it makes him seem like a butt. It does. does. I was like, I felt so bad for him because Yaz and Yaz and Ryan were talking about him, and we had had that wonderful moment where Ryan is just confessing to Yaz about what has happened in his life, why things are the way that there is, and and so much compassion. And then when he did give that fist bump, I was like, Ryan, damn it, you better fist bump him, or I'm going to come up there and. Fist you just saw a dude give birth. That if that's not a exactly, you moment, just I don't know what is. Exactly, you two just gave birth to a child. <laughs> Why aren't you guys on there? Um, so, guys, uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Kevin, you still. Um, what did you think about the he- final thoughts on the episode? Um, it's not an episode that broke any ground, but it also wasn't one of the worst episodes I've ever seen. I think a lot of good points are made. I think the Doctor's characterization kind of drives every episode that I see her in. Uh, not a really strong week for Yaz. I am looking for more from her, hopefully in the coming weeks. Um, yeah. I, I just, I want to see a fully original monster. I don't want to see something that reminds me of something else. And That's I actually wrote thing. that down. I wrote down too many humans. It's not even not even too many humans. It's just too many monsters that are reminiscent of something else. I I don't want to see it anymore. I want him to do something original, like the Jadoon that was original, like Mm -hmm. things like things like that. Like you know, add to the mythos and not don't just take like a character that everyone is gonna you know everyone talking about Harry Potter last week. It was a big joke, but then this week when it was Stitch Light, it was like oh okay, this is not like a joke. It's a thing that's happening. Yeah, now Stitch is in the universe of uh, Doctor Who in, in the in the very psychotic. And we're life. getting ET next week, actually. So. <laughs> and, uh, and everyone keeps calling him Evil Stitch, and I, I have to remind people that uh, Stitch, Stitch was is evil. evil. <laughs> Did everything he touches, he destroys. 
um, you know, bulletproof, fireproof, can survive the vacuum of space. Like, right. You it was well just have, Stitch. It was Experiment might, 626. You might as well have David Augensteyers go in there and do the whole monologue thing and then just say again. You know, yeah, like when she kicks him out of that... that shoe. <laughs> when, she eject, when she ejects him out of that ship, he's going to crash land in Hawaii. He found by... <laughs> <laughs> It's canon. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. If he finds a girl that says Pudge controls the weather, that's it. It's all over. It's all over. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, well, final thoughts on the episode? Final thoughts? Um, I thought it was just a good old-fashioned sci-fi episode. I It's a guilty pleasure. I enjoyed it. Um, I do agree. I wish that the design of Stitch was different, <clears throat> a.k.a. Patine. But um, other than that, you know, I feel like that was the only thing that really fell short of it. Besides, like, a couple minor issues, I loved the science behind all of the stuff. Gosh, that was horrible. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm, uh, it, uh, one of the things that I remember Russell T. Davies saying, and he was relating to this when he was bringing back Doctor Who, he was going to add the heart to the brain. Because if you really think about the first 26 years, it was more cerebral, very little heart. And he was at, he, he mentioned that he was going to make it more Buffy-esque. He was going to make it more heart. And I thought this episode was totally almost heart and then just some sci-fi things in there. And I just want to make sure because I was really taken aback that it's starting to leave its... I don't want to leave its sci-fi roots. It's embedded. It's it's locked in there. That it, for the first twenty six years it's been on, it's been locked in having these sci fi roots, well, and now it's kind of converted slightly into the fantasy. And I take challenge with it to first uh, Capaldi's first series at the very end. Well, love conquers all, and I said, no, 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 come on. That it, it's starting to dabble in the fantasy too much, and I wanted to come back to its sci fi roots. Just to the to science, it. and I loved that it. This one had the science. Yeah, and you know, it's a Star Trek conundrum. It's how do you bring in new fans for a long-running series without alienating the fans of the original? Like, how do you create something for both? I think Russell did a fine job. I think Russell T. did great. And I think Moffat, and I'll say this before and I save it again, Moffat, Stephen Moffat, is a wonderful, excellent, creative, and probably one of the best writers on Doctor Who. As a showrunner... Not a chance in hell. He needs a filter. He's he a, needs he's, a he's filter. A, he's the Vince Russo of, you know, Vince Russo was a guy who wrote <laughs> the WWE at a time when the WWE was like huge well, as the Attitude Era. But yeah. Vince Russo needed a Vince McMahon to slap him in the face and be like, those ideas are bad. These ideas yes. are good. Let's these ideas. Moffat has analogy. a few Jar Jars in his closet. All yeah. right. <laughs> Well, I mean, he when you see him in the interviews, he's got we got something exciting for everybody, and it's going to be very fantastic. Oh, you mean Missy is the master? We've all figured that out. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to what you know. Okay, what and and like the, like you said, the silence was really not wrapped up too well, and with like the 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 weeping angels that start off to be very scary monsters that would scare the hell out of you if you walked in you know in the middle of the night over at a Home Depot. And walked out in the garden section. They would scare the living bejeebies out of you. Then they became. You know, then all of a sudden, in the next year, episode, they had kung fu grip, and mm-hmm. they could take you back in time. I mean, they could. They, they could always take you back in time. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, like they had other features that, like, okay, it was scary enough that they could kill you with time travel. Well, that was the thing with Moffat. He started things very well. The silence were started very well. Yes. It's it was his wrapping things up that that didn't go to plan i think um because same with the weeping angels once they were drawn out a bit too much it was like oh they lost their luster you know same with the silence um most of moffat as a showrunner it was just he could start it but he couldn't finish it okay in this respect what do you guys think and i'm putting this in sage if you want to come back in on this because you were mentioning how the ratings were dropping and i'm not too I'm not too, too worried about that, but yeah, I do think it was because there were people who were interested in the first female doctor. Now we've gone from 10 to six, which doesn't bother me too much, but I, she still continued to teeter on down. And you said, Kevin, that it was more of the PC world that people were kind of being turned off by. I, I honestly don't even think it's that. That was just something that was said that that Sage said in the new, in the who knew news, but okay. 
I really think that it's because the show doesn't feel like Doctor Who anymore. And I that has nothing to do that. and that has nothing to do with a female doctor. It has everything to do with the monsters, the episodes, the overall tone of the season. It just feels very new and a lot of people are gonna reject that. Well, Jessica, and, and this is on, on top of the why, uh, and here's the question to both of you, if I didn't ask it properly. Why do you think the ratings are dropping? And this was a thing that I was holding Chibnall to the fire with. It was the monologue that Jody says right on the on the crane as she has jumped over, and the word that I was, and the sentence that I was poking at was the one that she, and I, I'm sorry, I'm totally paraphrasing, you can, can still become be- a better person but still remember what came before. And I thought that that's what Chris was doing with the series. But now, yeah, it's not my Doctor Who anymore. It is this something else that has changed. And maybe that's a reflection of what people are watching now and why they're kind of turning it off. Oh, I I definitely think so. This is the hybrid we didn't want. Um, <laughs> I mean, Jody. <laughs> we fabulous. had so many hybrids in the last... Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean Jody's wonderful and I I agree with Kevin. Like I don't think this is a um knock at Jody at all cuz she is doing absolutely amazing. Like yeah. she's the th- she's carrying it though. And I hate that that she and her as the doctor should not be carrying the show single-handedly and that's what it feels like. That is the only thing Doctor Who that feels like Doctor Who. Um, no, I, I miss that's, music. That's, that's the problem that you pick up when you pick up this role. You Everything is on your shoulder. It doesn't There's, matter anything behind you, even though it is all peripheral and supposed to be part of what is everything about the show, but everything rides on the Doctor. There's a lack of yeah. nostalgia. Everybody wants you know that moment that harkens back, something that reminds them of why they love Doctor Who and have been yeah. following it for so long. And I think that is what is missing, and is also contributing to the to the drop in ratings. So maybe that that line at the end of the first episode that I brought up is not being executed properly by Chris Chibnall, because he is kind of disavowing the way that he's going. He's kind of disavowing everything that came before. No classic monsters, nothing from the past. I mean, yeah, I mean, not even a mention of, you know, oh, how's Tegan doing? How's Ace doing? Or something like that. Or any echoes of the past to bring up, which I loved about Eccleston and, 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 and um, Matt Smith and Davidson because they had that advantage written in the script. I remember the moment I was geeking out, uh, the, the Runaway Bride, when the first time he mentions, you know, Gallifrey. And I totally flipped. Mm-hmm. I was like, yes, now Gallifrey's in here. Yes. The men, yeah. but it doesn't seem that it's going that way. And it, and it, I feel like also the other thing is that we're lacking is the music because we had had Murray gold mm-hmm. from the beginning, giving us an actual, there was a theme for every single doctor. And mm-hmm. if there was a mention or a throwback to any of their eras, mm-hmm. those themes came back subtly. And I know, I know a person, uh, a friend who absolutely adores David Tennant. That's his era. And when they had the moment with Capaldi and throwing back to Pompeii, it was as soon like the Pompeii moment was fine. But as soon as they played, the Tenth Doctor's theme. That's when he was like, "All right, I love Capaldi. That's it. Like, this is great. I love. You know, I want to watch yeah. all the Capaldi episodes." And, uh, and guys, that's what we're missing. They're they're giving us the go home. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, the guys are going to wrap it up there. Yes, uh, we get to thank you for joining us again, and stay tuned next week. We'll have new episodes at, coming out every Saturday. We are now on iTunes. We are now on Spreaker. We are now on CBS Radio. We are everywhere across the mainstream platform and you'll probably find more of it um you just google us and everything i want to thank jessica and kevin please check out kevin kevin again please mention what um your podcast uh justice watchtower podcast and uh also check out my book ross and Auntie, which is free this week through november the 9th and don't forget in a couple in a couple weeks we're going to be at claremont comic-con november 18th it's that sunday We'll be out there all day, and I've talked to Scott, and so far we are going to be hosting panels. Again, thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, Take care of yourselves. Tune in, log on, and always be part of the legend.